do you know this location? Well, this is a location called Hammarby Sjöstad, which is a res residential area situated on old uh, industrial grounds. Uh, and I happen to live here. So what you see here is my part of my daily commute when I go from home to my office, which is about a 20 minute walk. And I walk around these sort of old docks and, and stuff like that. And the water behind me here is actually the Baltic Sea. Let's uh, look back a little bit and just can you tell me how you first got interested in lights? What made you first look at that as a career? I uh, painted a light bulb with watercolors when I was in fifth grade, I think. Um, it, uh, it was a 75 watt bulb, so it was gorgeous in green for like 30 seconds before it exploded, since there was watercolor on it. So that's basically how, how the interest of changing things uh, with light or for light started. But I mean, this was at early stages. So uh, then I went as we were, you know, like everybody else into some sort of DJing and sound was tedious, filled with problems at all times. Then I sort of stumbled into the world of, of uh, making light shows instead of actually playing the records or playing music. Uh, I felt that I could express myself with light instead of sound, instead of music, but I could sort of be a part of music. I, I also constructed my own lighting systems. Uh, I built my own mirror balls, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah. When was that? Yeah, this was also 13, 14 years old. For, the, for your disco? Yeah, yeah, built my own. <laughs> Couldn't great. afford to buy one of those. So, you know, you went to the, to the glass shop and you got some, some spill parts of mirrors and then you cut them up yourself, you know, blood running from everything. <laughs> I still have one. Really? Yeah, I still have one. What was the path to being a professional? Later in life, when I was uh, doing uh, higher education, uh, I was uh, reading electrical and uh, um, electronics. And you had to do practicing on your summer holidays in order to get moved up to the next grade. So the first year I was out on a construction site running lines like everybody else was doing. But the second year I thought maybe I should do something more interesting. So. Since I was into lighting, I wrote a letter to the Swedish television and asked for a, for a practice place for this summer and they took me in. And then they actually offered me a job. And I was cocky enough to say, yeah, I can take this, but not after January because I had to study. Uh, and they said, okay, fine. So 1988, the 8th of January, I started a full-time employee at Swedish television. You weren't a lighting designer at that point? No, was I was your... a light, lighting technician right. at the time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a board operator, rigging and stuff like that. So I learned sort of by doing, learning the hard way of actually working. Sure. Back then it wasn't any yeah. school to become a light, schools to become a lighting designer. It didn't exist. So you have to learn it from the from the older guys. Sure. And how long were you at Swedish television? I was uh, 13 years. I was there as an employee. Wow. Yeah. Uh, then I went into the private sector. At I uh, would offer a job at Very Light Scandinavia. Uh, and then I started my own business uh, about, what is it now, 13, 14 years ago, something like that. And that was Eyebrow Designs? Yes. Named after your famous eyebrows? They actually, they actually trimmed today. Oh really? Uh, Especially be, for the interview? It could be worse. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk to you a bit about Melody Festival then. Yeah. Let's call it Mellow for yeah. short because Mello that's less sure. of a mouthful. <laughs> So, uh, Mello, for the record, is uh, it's the Swedish Eurovision Selection Competition. Yeah. Um, now, you've worked on it since 2002, I believe, and you, uh, you officially retired from Mello after your 20th one yeah. in 2021. Yeah. We do a six-week tour with this production, so it's six broadcasts. <laughs> It's, uh, it's four ordinary competitions and then we have a semi-final and then we have a final. Which is usually made in, now it's been a pandemic, but it's usually made in Friends Arena here in Stockholm. And we have a sold out audience of 35,000 people on the final. It's a huge event. So it's actually bigger than Eurovision yeah, it itself? Is. Yeah, it is. In if terms you, of you, in, ter in terms of live audience, it's bigger than that, yes. So it's been 20 interesting years with this baby uh, but it was time to to leave it and <laughs> let somebody else take over i have designed 609 eurovision potential eurovision songs during that period of time and then i'm not counting the opening acts and the intervals that are all stored in here in fragments most of them and they tend to pop up every now and then which is sometimes good but mostly bad <laughs> uh, do you have a favorite 
Yeah, I have a few favorites actually. Uh, there's one from I think 2004 uh, with a group called Ichiko. I remember they were named their name. Uh, I don't remember the name of the song though, but it's a bit of a rockier part that we uh, really enjoyed back then. And it sort of got stuck with me, so I, I like that. And then of course, Lorraine who won the Eurovision with Euphoria, because that was a very interesting journey we had. We realized on early stages in Sweden we had a fantastic artist, there was a great song. And we managed to make that package of the song visually. Uh, very exciting. It's one of those moments when everything falls in the right place uh, and we realized that here in Sweden on, on the finals when she won in Sweden that this this song really really had something and it had because it, it won the Eurovision later so that is also a fond memory. And over all that time and all those uh, 600 plus songs um, what's the biggest challenge in keeping it looking fresh and dynamic and different every year? Well, the, the good part of it is that we have a new set design every year and that sort of makes it, ha you have to start over every year. You have to draw a new lighting rig, you have to new use other gear, you have to adapt to that set. And that makes, uh, after all this time, the project still, still uh, very valuable and very fresh and you, and you have a, immediately a a very creative entrance into it since you have to come up with a new design every year for that set. And you don't miss it? No, I don't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can miss the rush of the live broadcast, but I do other live broadcasts, so you know, it is what it is. But uh, because that's working in TV, that's the most precious things when you're live uh, in front of a live TV audience. That's, that's still something uh, I really love, even if I do other things as well. You've lit three actual Eurovisions as well, haven't yep. you? Um, and all here in Sweden, obviously. Out of those three Eurovisions, do you have a favourite? The 2016 is by far the, I would say, my peak, if, if I could speak in those terms. But it was the most joyful, the most creative, and the result, if I may say so, is quite stunning. Uh, we were a field of, uh, a group of individuals that had a very good leadership within that says okay I'm going to point you in this direction and then I'm going to set you free and it was one of the most creative environments I ever worked in. I won't say we did it bad uh, 2013 but we were practicing a bit 2013 uh, I'm, I'm very proud of that as well but then we knew exactly what to do in 2016 because there was such a short time frame between them which sort of cooked down to a very creative environment with some very good people in the creative group and we had so much fun with it, took it very seriously. We tested and tried everything uh, beforehand, but when we went into production, we sort of all went, you know, uh, creatively berserk or something like that. It's my, my strongest memory of it is this craziness that never sort of had any stops. It stopped when we realized, okay, this is fun, this is a great idea, but we can't actually do it because of physics or something like that. Apart from Mellow and, and Eurovision, um, are there any other sort of career highlights that you spring to mind when, when you get asked that question? It was very funny to work with uh, television back in the late 80s and the 90s, especially here at Swedish Television, which back at the time in Sweden we didn't have that many TV channels. And uh, the Swedish television is the, is the public broadcaster, so public service broadcaster. So they had, back in the day, they did a lot of entertainment shows. And they had artists from all over the world visiting on a weekly basis to fill all these entertainment shows, which we were doing lighting in, of course. And there has been an endless row back then of fantastic artists and fantastic moments. Um, I have had birthday cake in a studio with Tina Turner, actually. Check Not many hat. people can say that. She actually cut me the, the cake and, and gave me the plate with it on. <laughs> What's great about living and working in Sweden? Well, this is... <laughs> yeah, it's pretty yeah, nice. I happen to live here. No, but I'd say we have, in Sweden, we have a very high level of knowledge within the business. We have a lot of good kit in, in the country. There's a lot of good suppliers. Uh, a lot of technicians that are very skilled in what they do. Uh, we have a very, uh, we have an easy way of working together, uh, as Swedes usually do. We, we have a very flat organizations and everything we do, which is I find is very rewarding. 
um, because when everyone is working together the result is usually very good. Um, so that's I think is a, it's a good place to be within the industry and it's not that big either we know sort of everyone knows each other or know them by name or something like that which is also sometimes fruitful sometimes not but I, I prefer the, the the first one with that.